Good evening. Blessed evening. I am here again, Pastor Adoris Nadorata of Pagasa Center, Ireland. And I would like to greet our Bishop Doc Ambat, Pastor Shirley, Pastor Benfor, Pastor Goss, Sister Karen, uh, Pastor Allen Bakani, and Pastor Asai, and uh, to all the primary leaders, cell members, and for you, We have been invited to watch our Bible study night and you are most welcome with us in this Bible study night. May we be able to experience a special revelation. So stay tuned. This is the second part of the book of Hebrews chapter 11. So it's Hebrews 11 verses 21 to 40. Let us pray. Father, we ask your guidance. May the Holy Spirit lead us, move us, and so that we may know and understand your word. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation you will give to us. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. So last week we have studied about uh, the list of Hall of Famer, uh, men who believe the promises of God and the word of God. And they were honored because of their faith. It begins with Abel who obtained righteousness because of his faith. And when Abel offered a lamb, a blood sacrifice, and so on and so forth. So now let's read Hebrews 11 verses 21 to 40. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph bowing in worship over the head of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. And then by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking at the reward. By faith, he left Egypt not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He's seeing the invisible, not on, on the, the visible things. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people, of, the people crossed the Red Sea, as on a dry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, they were drawn by faith. The walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. And then, what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, Put foreign armies to, to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sewn into two. They were killed with a sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, 
wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And all this, though commended through the faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us. That part from us, they should not be made perfect. Okay, God bless the words that were read tonight. A faith in God of the future is the theme of the this passage, this uh, second part. Those men mentioned Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, jo Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and his parents, the followers of Joshua and Rahab, you know the story, isn't it? A Gentile harlot were all futuristic. All of them were futuristic, thinking of the future of the invisible things. In each case, they died without having received what had been promised to them. Again, they died what they have been, what without having received what had been promised to them. They saw it afar off. He would give Abraham in exchange for his obedience. God continued. I will make you a great nation, he said to Abraham. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In verses 2 to 3, this promise had multiple components, including the promise of multiple descendants, fame, divine protection, and that Abraham, through his descendants, should be a blessing to all people. Abraham's son, Isaac, and grandson Jacob were heirs with him of the same promise. The Greek verb translated, not having received, it carries the notion of not having the promise in one's possessions or pocket, as it were. As people of faith, however, they could see this promise afar off. It's in the future, and we're assured of it. Uh, they are assured of the future, and embracing the vision of faith to their hearts, realizing that they were merely pilgrims and strangers in the here and now. The desire was so intense, yet they sensed this was not God's timing at the moment. Do we have faith? We have not seen yet, believe, and yet we believe and obey. These Hall of Famers put their lives on the foundation stones of faith in a reliable God, upon which the future would be erected. Someday, the building, the, the, the temple of faith would be finished. And according to verse 10, God himself would be the builder and maker or the creator. Now going to Abraham, he was told to offer his son Isaac. We can only imagine the horror and anguish of his heart as he wrestled with the rationale of such command. But he is the son of, pro the son of promise, the one through whom God is going to fulfill his promise. Surely there must be some mistake. Is it a bad dream? It's the silly pessimism of an old man who has waited so long. A foolish thought. I must get it out of my head. It cannot be true. Still, the command persisted. Abraham put aside his immediate gratification of having his son with him and in his mind gave him up to God. As our author says, believing that God was able to raise him even from the dead. That is faith against all common sense. But who said the God in whom Abraham believed was at all common? In the very process of the sacrifice, God provided by other means showing the importance of obedience, but at the same time, his gracious provisions of our needs. When he acts in belief, God gets, gets into act. If we believe, God will get into action. Now, Isaac, looking into the future also, although no, no kind of demand was placed upon him, provide for you and your little ones. 
I am dying. God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And you shall carry up my bones from here. In Genesis 50, 20-21 and 24-25, He too, like his father before him, trusted God for the promise of the future. For the land which they one day would inherit by the promise of God. Joseph was a futuristic too. Now with Moses, we know the story of him in the palace. Moses also was futuristic, not willing to trade off the ultimate promise for the advantages that would have been immediate and powerful in the land of Egypt. He sensed that somehow he was to be identified with the people of his birth, even in the bondage and servitude. He saw no indication whatever that he was to be the victorious leader. He simply trusted God with the future of his life. In this example, Moses, our writer uses five illustrations of futuristic obedience. The first concerns his parents. For his mother, there might have been an immediate advantage of keeping her son. Her mother instincts could well have overcome her faith. Moses chose to share the ill treatment of his people, own people. Moses began to stammer in speech, the problem growing until he could scarcely be understood. All the sophistication, all the education, all the military prowess and brilliance of that mind and spirit were bound with inner tension. A tension between the son of Pharaoh daughter and a son of Hebrew slaves. To identify himself with the Hebrews would mean letting go all the advantages he had known and the possibility of helping his people through the power that he would eventually have. Perhaps he dreamt of the time when he could release them from their bondage and elevate them to a respected position among the nations of the earth. Instead, he gave all that over and chose to share the ill treatment of his own people. Then one day when seeing an Egyptian slave master beating a Hebrew slave, he could not restrain himself in actions learned all too well in the gymnasium of martial arts. He suddenly and quickly killed the Egyptian. The break with Pharaoh was complete. There was but one course of action, flee to the desert and be lost from the eyes and reach of Pharaoh's justice. Can you imagine the resulting tension and anger he carried for, a year, for years while keeping ship on the backside of the desert of Sinai? Nevertheless, he saw there's something more worth than the treasures of Egypt. Our writer says, he endured on seeing him who is invisible. In verse 27, the vision of God at the burning bush gave him the strength to make what many might feel was so unbelievable break. By faith, Moses believed that God indeed would send the angel of death upon the firstborn of Pharaoh's land. In the face of such imminent death, he must have truly trusted God to pass over the homes of faith, whose only indication was a few swatches of blood over the lintel and on the doorposts, such frail barriers to the awesome power of God. When crossing the Red Sea, Moses' heart and the hearts of the people must have hesitated more than a moment at the situation. It might seem that it was the wind that had blown the shallow sea. When the Israelites reached the Red Sea, Moses stretched out his hand and the waters divided, allowing his followers to save passage. The Egyptians followed them, but God again commanded Moses to stretch out his hand and the sea engulfed the army. The story is recounted in the Old Testament in Exodus 14, 19 to 31. The angel of God in a pillar of cloud stood between the people 
and the Egyptians protecting the Hebrews. Then Moses stretched his hand out over the sea. The Lord caused a strong east wind to blow all night, parting the waters and turning the sea into a dry land. The circumstances would have known that once the wind ceased, that water would come rushing back to engulf anything or anyone present in that massive swirl, swirling tide. How long will it take to the Hebrews to cross? Would the first make it and the remainder be lost in the sea? Eventually, evidently Moses computed all the possibilities but banked on what he considered the greatest and what it is the trustworthiness of God. Yes, the waters did come, swirling back, but not until all the children of Hebrews were saved through the shallows, only when the armies of the Pharaoh tried to follow hard after did those waters rush, rush back, claiming those who stood in the way, chariot wheels stuck on the soft earth of the sea bottom. How about Rahab? Rahab, by acknowledging the past actions of the God of Israel, could see what lay ahead. Again, future, what lay ahead. As a futurist, she asked the spies to spare her, to, sp to spare her and her family when they came into the land. She said, in simple faith, I know that the Lord has given you the land, the Lord your God. He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath, Joshua 2, 9 and 11. Hebrews 11, 31, it says that Rahab did not perish with the disobedient because of what she did by faith. Her heart melted in the fear of the Lord, but by faith it was rebuilt strong again. Rahab's faith saves the spies, the spies and saves Israel and saves her family. In the process, Rahab also gained a special role in God's story. She lived in faith and in the bloodline of our Lord Jesus Christ. The passage, including verses 32 to 40, is one of the most passionate and dramatic statements in all of the Christian literature. The rise of emotion in our author becomes a swelling tide of rhetorical brilliance with the opening words, what more shall I say? He longed for enough time to flesh out of the story of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel. One can sense a flood of emotion aching for expression, but he must satisfy himself with few closing paragraphs in one of his most fervent subjects, faith. His heroes fall into two categories, those who knew victory before their deaths and those whose faith had to be futuristic because all the tragedy of life they endured in faith had its reward in later generations. Now how about King David? Through faith some subdued kingdoms. There was David amidst great obstacle from a paranoid king who sought his life to a son, who sought his throne, David endured. He endured until the stretch of Israel's might stretched across expanse of land. One of his court members struggled with the price of justice. Nathan had to tell the powerful and beloved king, popular and on a high roll, that he was guilty of adultery and murder. He could have lost his head but his call for justice was heard by a penitent David. Fortunately, Nathan lived to see the result in 2 Samuel 12. Now we go to Abraham and Sarah. Others obtained promises through lively, persisting faith. Imagine Abraham, Abraham and Sarai, receive a promise and long for child almost a score of years after the original promise was made. How frustration and agony must have caused the two to, to doubt, to wonder, and take things into their own hands, which they did. After perhaps a decade of waiting, Sarai induced Abram to go into, into her 
handmaid and have the child by her. Not until 14 years later did Sarah finally bear her own son. The fulfillment of God's promises is not always the most important thing. Rather, is what happens to us in the waiting period. In the waiting period, we know that the fulfill fulfillment of God's promise is so important. But how about what happens to us in the waiting period? That is what what is um, the most important thing. Abraham and Sarah became the paragons of faith for the community of believers through all generations. Their names will always be associated with faith in Genesis 12 to 21. How about Daniel? In a determination some might call religious fanaticism refused to bow to an ego-saturated King Darius. Full of remorse, he had signed in a moment of arrogant delusion and having attempted all day to circumvent his own law, Darius expresses his hope that Daniel's God will deliver him. The courageous believer is sealed in the den of lions. Darius then passed all night sleeplessly enduring the endless hours when the first signs of dawn light the sky he is carried out of the palace shattering all protocol by hurrying to the den every step of his dim path intensifies the rising search of feeling within him letting go all of his noble kingly behavior he cries out in a tone of anguish Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions in Daniel 6.20? Is God able? Immensely. Daniel was saved and Darius converted. Just read the song of praise Darius raises to God in Daniel 6.26-27. If your soul languishes in the face of seemingly Overwhelming ads, read it and trust in a great God. Prior to this, Daniel and his renamed companions escaped the desperately hot fire Nebuchadnezzar had planned for those who would not worship him. After his first encounter with the political power gun out of control, some might have breathed a sigh of relief and determined not to pay that price again. But not Daniel. Faith in Almighty God should be proportionate to the object of faith. He was willing to face a fiery furnace in Daniel 3, 1 to 30. How about Gideon? He saw the power of God without the power of human sword in Judges 7, Elijah in 1 Kings 19, and Elisha in 2 Kings 6, Elisha or Elisha. They saw victory without the bloodshed. And in Moses' weakness found both strategy and strength to continue serving God in Exodus 18 and Numbers 11. Weak as they were in the moment of fatigue and, extrem and extremity, God showed himself in various ways to meet their hunger, their hunger for faith. David's faith in the power of God to win a victory over Goliath put a Philistine army in a disarray in 1 Samuel 17. So there were supporting verses that would prove that these Hall of Famers who, who won the hearts of God by their faith. The widow of Zarephath who hosted Elijah received her son back in health after breath had gone out of him. Elijah's faith in the healing power of God and his urgent prayers were the avenues of God's might in 1 Kings 17. Not all men and women of faith had the rewards of faith in their grasp during their lifetimes. However, others were what? Tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection in Hebrews 11.35. I cannot help thinking that our the author of the book has the mind of martyrdom of Paul, which probably took place one or two years or even a month, a few months before the writing of this episode. If Paul had played the game 
a bit more politically, he doubtless could have had his freedom. In Acts 25.12 and 26.32, if as tradition has it, Paul was beheaded in AD 67 or 68, and this episode was written in AD 68 or 69, then the memory of his death still burned as a fresh hot fire in the heart of his mind. The persecution may well have been going on in the empire since AD 64 when Nero proclaimed holding the Christian faith a crime worthy of death and falsely accused and imprisoned Christians. He killed them all in all sorts of Im imaginative ways. In the circuses of Rome, even dressing them in an animal skins to be ravaged by hungry lions. Gawking shouting mobs crowded the arenas to watch the carnage with their almost insatiable appetites for violence. They were not worthy of these simple believers who in their destitute appeared so frail and powerless. Yet these martyrs turned not only stomachs but the souls of Rome. They fled to the caves of the wilderness and wandered across the deserts on their way to distant lands to preach and find safety in verses 35 to 37. These latter Christians died without having possessed the promise. In spite of their empty-handedness, they persevered in faith knowing that their faith's reward is not always given now. Revolu revolutionaries over the world have died for future generations. So it's just like the Hall of Famers. Is that any less true of, this, of these Hall of Famers or saints? This was a foundational faith upon which others built. Their perfection, their completedness is not in their own experience, but in ours. In Romans 4, 9, Paul states that God reckoned an accountant's word meaning it is credited to righteousness, the righteousness to Abraham. At times we are credited with resources that cannot be withdrawn until a deposit is made. When these saints see us walking into the bank of God and coming out with our hands full of abundance of God's grace in Jesus Christ, they know that their completion has come as well. They rejoice to see our day, for our day becomes their day of rejoicing in the appropriation of the grace of Jesus Christ. What a glorious responsibility we share to complete the lives and the faith of those who have paid the price of faith before us. There are a group of young German theological students who after the Second World War had bicycled to Northern Italy to participate in an ecumenical work camp in the Alps. They had grown up during the dreaded days of Hitler's Germany, knowing nothing but the demo Goggery that led that historic nation into such tragic defeat. But no sooner had the acrid war clouds of fighting between the Allied and the Axis powers blown away, giving hope of their once again being able to breath the air of liberty and freedom, than they were stifled by the oppression of a communist government. Once again, they were betrayed by some of their own countrymen who were willing to sell their souls for a bit of power of security by cooperating with the new regime. These young men knew nothing but oppression. Now at the camp, they told us stories of their fathers, of these young men. Yeah? Christians, this man had been taken by the secret police. Not one of the young men knew the circumstance of his father, yet each continued these studies in order to become a pastor ministering to the community of the faithful. One of the men told the story of his New Testament professor who was taken into custody by communist authorities. 
wanting to break down the leadership and make it subservient to Marxist ideology. They subjected their professor to the diabolic process of brainwashing. They would let him sleep only two or three hours a night. His food was taken, was kept from him until he almost died of starvation and then he was fed just in time to save him. He said that strangely, he appreciated the efforts of those who fed him back to some strength and even kindness toward them. He was tortured by having a hollow steel cylinder placed over his head and struck at random intervals with a steel hammer so as almost to make him deaf. His cell was only one end by 10 millimeters in dimension so that he could not stretch out or exercise. Imagine. His light, which was kept on at all hours, was recessed into the, con the concrete ceiling and covered with a steel mess so that he could not get out of it. At it. He had no idea of day or, or night, how many days he had been incar incarcerated. All they wanted from him was a confession that he had participated in teaching a religion that was an opiate of the people. His response was one of the strength and refusal to cooperate. They asked him time after time how he could say that the life he had known with Jesus Christ was not a sham. Then the fatigue and confusion of starvation began to take their, their toll. He knew he was close to the breaking point. Certainly God would understand. Then one occasion when he was left to himself for a short period of cherished rest, his cell was filled with a light far more brilliant than that of electric light bulb. He saw no figure but knew that God was present in the form of this light. He heard no sound but understood the message, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you power for whatever comes. You will be utterly sufficient. As he thought he had a full night's sleep, his body was refreshed and then his mind was renewed as having been loved once for a long and therapeutic period. Passages of the Greek Testament he had memorized came back into a rush of his clarity and brilliance. Truths from the word that he had never perceived before flooded over him with a powerful energy. A few days later, he was suddenly released. He could hardly believe he was walking through the streets of his town. Those he loved, to his students and those to whom he preached, he was a firebrand of apostolic. There was a glimpse of future into, into the eyes of faith. He conquered kingdoms and sent burning torches to set aflame the dry kindling of God hungering hearts. He was multiplied in scores of his students, ministering with such power as to confute the authorities. Now remember the Bishop of Uganda, Festo Kivenjeri, came to visit at uh, the author in Washington, D.C. As the magnificent man of God stood, and he felt, though a tired Western church, was hearing a dynamic new word from one who has been sent out as missionary, how desperately we needed in this church, and what is communion in Africa. The historical tables of missionary activity has reversed. He spoke of his countrymen who had suffered in the hands of Idi Amin. Many had been killed, many tortured, yet as they were placed before firing squads, they spoke of God's love to their executioners. Smiles wreathed their faces and their song to Jesus filled the stadiums or the fields where they were martyred. Waves were converted so that the present rate of the Christian growth continues in Africa. Three, 300 million or 500 million were baptized Christians. Those who died had, had, had one thing in common. 
they have one common belief. They were going to be with Jesus immediately upon their early death. Now they add to that great cloud of witness, witnesses sitting in the stadium of eternal history and shouting encouragement to those of who, who run our races. God grant that we can hear their shouts. May we too be the futuristic of faith. I believe your testimonies of faith is encouraging like that of the Hall of Famer. It's like of that. The man of faith sees far more what is beyond. Having faith is not automatic, guaranteed that we will not suffer. God may give us deliverance or to suffer. It is a problem we don't understand. It's why godly people suffer. My ability to accept the suffering. When John Bonyan was facing prison, he prayed to God, I will appreciate you, Lord, when you free me from going to prison. But if you have a ministry for me in prison, that will be done. It takes greater faith to hold on to God when you don't understand the circumstances, the pain, hang on to God in time of suffering. So let us close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for the lives of the all of famers, O oh God, in the Old Testament, Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, Rahab, and many others, O oh God, they set the bar. And I do pray, we believe, Lord God, that we will also be, the more we will have a greater faith on you, that we will be looking at the future, looking at that blessed hope, your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. We honor you and praise you that these Hall of Famers will be living examples for us to live. That all of us may be called men of faith. We praise you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for watching. Magasa Center loves you. God loves you most. Thank you. Bye.